In keeping with what Dick Ross has just reported and said and requested, I want to take this opportunity to thank hundreds and thousands of you that have prayed and believed by faith and given that the New York Crusade might be used of God in this year of our Lord, 1957. The past three weeks have seen the meetings reach an unprecedented high in attendance, spirit and response, climaxed with the great service last night with its attendance of more than 100,000 people. There are elements in this crusade that we haven't experienced in any previous campaign. The Spirit of God is moving upon the audience far deeper than ever before. There is a holy hush, a reverence, and an expectancy greater than we've ever sensed in any crusade anywhere. The burden of prayer is greater. All night prayer meetings are breaking out in many parts of the area. Hundreds and thousands of people are earnestly praying that the revival tide will continue to rise until every part of New York, social, domestic, and church life will feel the impact of spiritual awakening. Already, thousands of men and women have accepted Christ's terms of salvation and have been wonderfully transformed. I wish you could hear some of their stories. I wish you could see some of their faces. I wish you could see the transformation that has taken place in so many lives. We have literally thousands of letters which describe in detail the change Christ has wrought in the lives of those who have made definite commitments to him. The Spirit of God has reached out through the electronic fingers of television, through radio, through the printed word in the press, through word of mouth, and multiplied thousands have been brought to Christ as a result. We are seeing at the moment more than 2,500 people writing in every week saying, I have received Jesus Christ as Savior. No other power could induce people to leave their homes, their jobs, and their interests and draw them to this spiritual mecca where needy men and women are being brought into contact with a compassionate and merciful God through Jesus Christ. For example, a young couple from Chicago had been having serious domestic trouble. In fact, they had saved enough money to start their divorce proceedings. But they heard how God was working in the New York crusade and decided to use the money they had saved for a divorce to visit the meeting at the garden. They somehow felt that God was the answer to their problems and together they vowed to give him a chance. They came forward to accept Christ during their first visit to the crusade. Their marriage was saved. Another man, a manager of a car rental agency in a big city, watched the telecast Saturday night before last. He was stricken with deep conviction and was made conscious of the need of Christ in his life. He rushed to New York, came to the garden, and yielded his heart and life to Christ. He returned to his home and his business, radiantly happy and with peace he had never known before. What is it that is drawing people from every corner of America to New York? Believe me, they're not coming to hear a preacher. They're not coming just to hear music as good as it may be. They're not coming just to see large crowds. They're not coming just because of the publicity. They're coming because they sense that God is here, that he is working in a special way in this specific place, because multiplied thousands have concentrated their prayers on New York, because Christians in this area have labored in unity of spirit, because hundreds of consecrated people in this area have served unselfishly for God's glory, because Christians have carried a burden for the lost, because non-essentials are being minimized and Christ has been magnified. God has seen fit to pour out his spirit upon this city, and we give him the glory and the praise and the honor in answer to prayer. The New Testament pattern has never been altered. When God's people pray, when they are in accord, and when they exalt Christ, spiritual fire is the inevitable result. And spiritual fire can break out in any community in the United States when God's conditions are met. In your community, in your city, in your town, in your village, wherever you are, the Spirit of God can do the same thing that he is doing in New York City when God's conditions are met. The greatest revival of all time was the great spiritual outpouring at Pentecost. And I want you to notice certain factors that were operating at Pentecost. First, Pentecost was preceded by earnest prayer. The Bible says these all continued in prayer and supplication. Pentecost came in an atmosphere that was saturated by sincere prayer. 
They not only prayed, but they made supplication, which is to say that they implored, they begged God to send His Spirit to their waiting, hungry, empty hearts. Never have we been so aware that God's people are praying as we have been during this crusade. It seems that we've been giving superhuman strength for the occasion. Obstacles have been hurdled. Problems have been solved. Difficulties have been surmounted. Victories have been gained, which can only be attributed to the work of a gracious God in answer to the prayers of his people. Secondly, Pentecost was preceded by the unity of God's people. The Bible says these all continued with one accord. Never have we seen greater harmony among the workers and the committee members. As we watch the hundreds of ushers, counselors and choir members functioning as one body, we are reminded of Paul's words which he said, So we, being many, are one body in Christ. You cannot tell what denomination they are members of, but it is evident that they are Christians, and that is the important thing. God has blessed this spiritual unity and because of it a great volume of divine power has been released upon this city. When the people prayed, were in one accord and sought the will of God, Pentecost was the result. Then followed the sound from heaven, the mighty rushing wind and the fire of God. These are the elements that man cannot supply. These are the supernatural factors without which all else would be lifeless and worthless. A church on fire invariably attracts the multitudes. When the church loses its fire, its warmth and its passion, it cannot penetrate the barriers of paganism and materialism which surround it. The disciples of Christ made no impression upon a godless world until they became a church on fire. After they had prayed earnestly, waited patiently and believed sincerely, the fire from heaven fell upon them. The Bible says, Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were amazed. Church history reveals that many times more people are brought into the church during periods of revival than during eras of so-called normalcy. So many more, in fact, that I'm convinced that revival is the normal function of the Christian church. The church was born in a supernatural revival at Pentecost. It was nourished and invigorated by the revivals of the first century. It has been sustained by revivals down through the years. The church can no more dispense with these periods of spiritual resurgence than the Atlantic Ocean can exist without the flood tide which rushes in periodically to purge away all the filth and debris deposited by the stagnant ebbing waters. It has pleased God to send a flood tide to New York City. Spiritual indifference, hypocrisy, intolerance, ill will, and unbelief are being swept away in many lives. There is a concern for the loss never before noted among Christians here in New York City. Christianity is being discussed openly by people on the street, in the cabs, in the buses, everywhere. Everywhere there's an invigorating interest in spiritual matters. There are elements present here which defy explanation. An auditorium which only the most optimistic ventured to predict would be filled on weekends has proven too small to accommodate the crowds every night. Last night, there were many that said that Yankee Stadium would be only half filled or a third filled on the hottest night of the year, and yet God did it. It was jammed with the greatest crowd in history. Every night this past week, it has been my privilege to speak to hundreds in the overflow crowd which milled around the 49th Street entrance at Madison Square Garden, but were unable to get in. Each evening, after a brief talk, scores of these standees indicated a willingness to accept Christ as their Savior and Lord. We've heard marvelous stories of people that have been converted right out on the street. Certainly the Lord is moving. But now in this time of great spiritual victory is the moment when the devil is going to strike. I am looking for Satan to strike during this coming week in an unprecedented way. That is the reason we need more prayer now than ever before. We need prayer that will build a wall around this city and around this crusade as we enter the 10th and the 11th weeks, as we come to the most crucial period of this crusade. Many people have said, well, where does the strength of the team come from? You're having scores of meetings every day, week after week. How do you keep it up? As thy day, so shall thy strength be. 
We have sensed the prayers of the Lord's people. It is God that is supplying the strength. We need your prayer for physical strength. We need your prayer for spiritual strength. That God will give us more spiritual power than ever before. We need your prayer. That God will also hold back the flood tide of the enemy. The Bible says when the enemy comes in like the flood, the Spirit of the Lord can lift a standard against him. Yes, we give glory to God this day, but we are staying on our knees beseeching God for even greater things, that the spirit of revival that is evident here will spread across the nation and throughout the world, and that we will see a revival in 1957. Yes, many lives are being changed, many homes rearranged, a few evenings ago, Captain Jennison of the New York City Police Force and one of our advisors told us that one of the officers under his supervision were sent out to an apartment house to quiet a family row. The couple were quarreling violently and the home was on the verge of total ruin. The policeman who was a Christian spoke to them about Christ and invited them to come to the crusade. The next night they came and both accepted Christ. They have both purchased Bibles and have discovered that the peace of Christ is the best answer to domestic confusion. We are seeing that on every hand. And so the mark of revival continues to leave its mark on the world's greatest city. Yesterday at Yankee Stadium, when we saw those people there, not to see a baseball game, but to hear the glorious good news, the greatest news ever to reach the ears of mankind, the tidings that Christ died for our sins and rose again for our justification, while our hearts were thrilled, we were all so humble to realize that it was the answer to the prayers of God's people. We are going to ask you to continue your prayers. And now you, who may be listening to my voice, but are not yet in Christ, I beg of you to heed Christ's appeal when he said, Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. That makes every man eligible. The condition for acceptance is not intelligence, riches, respectability, or achievements. The man who is a failure is just as welcome as the person who has succeeded. There is no difference, says the Bible. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But in Christ we find forgiveness for sin, cleansing from unrighteousness, rest from our labors, and a blessed hope for the future. Whoever you are that are listening to my voice can receive Christ into your heart. Many of you are riding along in your motor car. Many of you are on vacation, on the beach, in the mountains at some club listening to this broadcast you can receive Christ just where you are just as though you were in Madison Square Garden or Yankee Stadium just as though you had walked down the aisle and openly confessed Christ as your Savior so now in the quietness of your room in the quietness of your car you can say yes to Jesus Christ open your heart and say oh God I repent of my sins I renounce my sins by faith I receive Jesus Christ as Savior. As you are changing lives in New York City, so change my life. He'll do it. In a moment, in an instant, you can start a total new life in Christ. During the past few days, it has been my privilege to appear on a number of television shows. I've also had the privilege of meeting and talking with a great number of people from coast to coast in hotels, on airplanes, in Hollywood film studios, in the studios of the three major networks. Last night, just before I went to sleep, I began to think about those various conversations. It seemed that there was one theme that ran through all of them. The theme was salvation and the new birth. I've had more people in the last two weeks ask me how to be saved, what does it mean to be born again, or to tell me their own sometimes weird experiences in seeking God than any two weeks in many years. For example, as we were coming across the country the other day on an airliner, the stewardesses and some of the people gathered around to ask questions about their own personal relationship with God. The Bible teaches that Satan deceives the whole world. Jesus said, take heed that no man deceive you. Jesus also foretold that many false prophets will rise and shall deceive many. Paul also sounded the alarm, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The apostle John had to warn even in the first century of many antichrists. He said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Peter also warned, 
but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Today, there are many false prophets misleading people to a wrong entrance and to a wrong gate to the kingdom of God. Many of these were expressed to me in these conversations during the past couple of weeks. Many of them had, had many weird ideas as to how to be saved. Jesus said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Time after time during the past two weeks, I've told people how they can find Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. In going deep into the matter with them, I find that the great problem is commitment. One university professor told me of his own inward struggle in moral, spiritual, and intellectual issues. He said, more and more I've come to realize that my problem with Christianity is really not intellectual at all. It is moral. I've not been willing to meet the moral requirements of Jesus Christ. And then he asked this question, what can I do to receive Jesus Christ? The other night, the governor of one of our states called me on the phone. He seemed to be struggling with his emotions, but finally he said to me, I'm at the end of my rope. I need God. Can you tell me how to find God? Tomorrow night, I will be speaking at one of the great federal prisons in the United States. I remember visiting a group of men on death row in a prison some years ago. A strong and intelligent looking man listened to what I had to say. Then I asked the men if they would be willing to kneel down while I prayed. Just before we knelt there, the man said, Can you explain once again what I must do to be forgiven of my sin? I want to know that I'm going to heaven. These are precisely the same questions asked of Jesus Christ nearly 2,000 years ago. They are the same questions asked of the apostles as they proclaimed the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. The questions indicate that man's inward spiritual longings have changed very little in these hundreds of years. The rich young ruler came running to kneel before Christ and ask him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? After Peter preached his great sermon at Pentecost, the people were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter, What shall we do? The African nobleman riding in his chariot across the desert talked with Philip the evangelist. Suddenly the nobleman stopped his chariot and said, What doth hinder me? At midnight the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now 20th century man asked the same question that man has always asked. It is just as relevant today as it was in the past. Just what must one do to be reconciled to God? What does the Bible mean by such words as conversion, repentance, and faith? I know that you've heard it over and over again. But even though I've been a Christian nearly 40 years, I like to hear it explained over and over and over again. These are all salvation words, but so little understood by the masses of people. Jesus made everything so simple and we've made it so complicated. He spoke to the people in short sentences and everyday words, illustrating his messages with never-to-be-forgotten stories. Today, the devil would like us to use high-sounding phrases, to invent new terminologies, to use words that people cannot really understand. When the Philippian jailer asked the Apostle Paul, what must I do to be saved? Paul gave him a very simple answer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. This is so simple that millions stumble over it. The one and only choice by which you can be converted is your choice to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You don't have to straighten out your life first. You don't have to make things right at home or in your business first. You don't have to try to give up some habit that is keeping you from God. You've tried all that and failed many times. In our crusades, when I give the invitation to receive Christ, we sing the hymn entitled, Just As I Am and you come to Christ just as you are. The blind man came as he was. The leper came as he was. Mary Magdalene with seven devils came as she was. The thief on the cross came as he was. You can come to Christ just as you are right now. The word conversion means simply turning from the beginning of the Bible to the end. God pleads with men to turn to him. However, it is impossible for man to turn to God, to repent, or even to believe without God's help. All you can do is call upon God to turn you. Many times in the Bible it is recorded that men did that very thing. When a man calls upon God, he is giving true repentance and faith. That is why the Apostle Paul could say, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
The Bible never asks man to justify himself, to regenerate himself, to convert himself, or to save himself. God alone can do these things. There are at least two elements in conversion, repentance and faith. Jesus said, except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. Repentance carries with it a recognition of sin involving personal guilt and defilement before God. It does not mean a cringing self-contempt. It is a simple recognition of what we are. We see ourselves as God sees us, and we say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Job said, I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Repentance also means a change of feeling. This means a genuine sorrow for sin committed against God. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7, Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Repentance means also a change of purpose and carries with it the idea of an inward turning from sin by the exercise of the will. However, all you have to do is to be willing. And then if you're willing, God will help you in your conversion and in your repentance. Repentance is the launching pad where the soul is sent on its eternal orbit with God at the center of the ark. When our hearts are bowed as low as they can get and we truly acknowledge and forsake our sins, then God takes over. And like the second stage of a rocket, he lifts us toward his kingdom. The way up is down. Man got into difficulty when he lifted his will against God. He gets out of trouble when he bows to the divine superiority. When he repents and says humbly, God be merciful to me a sinner, then man's extremity becomes God's opportunity. Now the second element in conversion is faith. In order to be converted, you must make a choice. The scripture says, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now who is it that is not condemned? It is he that believes. And who is condemned already? It is he that does not believe. Then what must you do in order to be not condemned? The answer is simple. You must believe. Now, of course, we must understand what that word believe implies. It means commit and surrender. The Bible teaches that without faith, it is impossible to please God. The Bible says, he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Believing is your response to God's offer of mercy, love, and forgiveness. God took the initiative. Salvation is all of God. When Christ bowed his head on the cross and said, it is finished, he meant just that. God's plan for our reconciliation and redemption was completed in his son. However, man must respond by receiving and trusting. The most obvious thing about saving faith is that it believes something or someone. It does not believe everything or just anything. It is belief in a person, and that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. Neither is faith antagonistic to reason or knowledge. Faith is not anti-intellectual. Leighton Ford has said, Belief is not faith without evidence, but commitment without reservation. Belief involves the intellect. Desire involves the emotions. Commitment involves the will. Thus the whole man is involved in an act of proper faith. Faith is actually what we know, how we feel, and what we do about Jesus Christ. Thus faith becomes action, and the action is faith as commitment. With some persons there may be in conversion an emotional crisis, the symptoms of which are similar to those of mental conflict. There may be deep feeling, an outward outburst of tears and anxiety, and yet there may be none of those things. There are those who experience little of any emotion. They accept salvation without any particular crisis of mind or emotion. They cannot in fact specify any definite time when they first entered into their knowledge of Christ. When Jesus described the new birth to intellectual dignified Nicodemus, he said, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Jesus said it was like the movement of the wind which sometimes is as quiet as a light breeze, and at other times as revolutionary as a hurricane like David or Frederick that hit the coast. 
Conversion is like that too, sometimes quiet and tender, sometimes uprooting and rearranging the lives under great emotional manifestation. There is also the act of the will in conversion. This is actually a volitional resolution. People can pass through mental conflicts and emotional crises without being converted. Not until they exercise their prerogative as a free moral agent and will to be converted are they actually converted. This act of the will is an act of acceptance and commitment. They willingly accept God's mercy and receive God's Son and then commit themselves to do God's will. In every true conversion, the will of man comes into line with the will of God. Almost the last word of the Bible is this invitation, and whosoever will, let him take up the water of life freely. It is up to you. You must will to be saved. It is God's will, but it must also become your will. I'm going to ask you to receive Jesus Christ right now by repentance and faith. Will you do it today? Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that many that have been listening will be convicted by the Holy Spirit and will repent of their sins and turn to Christ as Savior. For we ask it in His name. Amen. In keeping with what Dick Ross has just reported and said and requested, I want to take this opportunity to thank hundreds and thousands of you that have prayed and believed by faith and given that the New York Crusade might be used of God in this year of our Lord, 1957. The past three weeks have seen the meetings reach an unprecedented high in attendance, spirit, and response, climaxed with the great service last night with its attendance of more than 100,000 people. There are elements in this crusade that we haven't experienced in any previous campaign. The Spirit of God is moving upon the audience far deeper than ever before. There is a holy hush, a reverence, and an expectancy greater than we've ever sensed in any crusade anywhere. The burden of prayer is greater. All night prayer meetings are breaking out in many parts of the area. Hundreds and thousands of people are earnestly praying that the revival tide will continue to rise until every part of New York, social, domestic, and church life will feel the impact of spiritual awakening. Already, Thousands of men and women have accepted Christ's terms of salvation and have been wonderfully transformed. I wish you could hear some of their stories. I wish you could see some of their faces. I wish you could see the transformation that has taken place in so many lives. We have literally thousands of letters which describe in detail the change Christ has wrought in the lives of those who have made definite commitments to him. The Spirit of God has reached out through the electronic fingers of television, through radio, through the printed word in the press, through word of mouth, and multiplied thousands have been brought to Christ as a result. We are seeing at the moment more than 2,500 people writing in every week saying, I have received Jesus Christ as Savior. No other power could induce people to leave their homes, their jobs, and their interests and draw them to this spiritual mecca where needy men and women are being brought into contact with a compassionate and merciful God through Jesus Christ. For example, a young couple from Chicago had been having serious domestic trouble. In fact, they had saved enough money to start their divorce proceedings. But they heard how God was working in the New York crusade and decided to use the money they had saved for divorce to visit the meeting at the garden. They somehow felt that God was the answer to their problems and together they vowed to give him a chance. They came forward to accept Christ during their first visit to the crusade. Their marriage was saved. Another man, a manager of a car rental agency in a big city, watched the telecast Saturday night before last. He was stricken with deep conviction and was made conscious of the need of Christ in his life. He rushed to New York, came to the garden, and yielded his heart and life to Christ. He returned to his home and his business, radiantly happy and with peace he had never known before. What is it that is drawing people from every corner of America to New York? Believe me, they're not coming to hear a preacher. They're not coming just to hear music as good as it may be. They're not coming just to see large crowds. They're not coming just because of the publicity. They're coming because they sense that God is here, that he is working in a special way in this specific place. 
because multiplied thousands have concentrated their prayers on New York, because Christians in this area have labored in unity of spirit, because hundreds of consecrated people in this area have served unselfishly for God's glory, because Christians have carried a burden for the lost, because non-essentials are being minimized and Christ has been magnified. God has seen fit to pour out his spirit upon this city and we give him the glory and the praise and the honor in answer to prayer. The New Testament pattern has never been altered. When God's people pray, when they are in accord, and when they exalt Christ, spiritual fire is the inevitable result. And spiritual fire can break out in any community in the United States when God's conditions are met. In your community, in your city, in your town, in your village, wherever you are, the Spirit of God can do the same thing that He is doing in New York City when God's conditions are met. The greatest revival of all time was the great spiritual outpouring at Pentecost. And I want you to notice certain factors that were operating at Pentecost. First, Pentecost was preceded by earnest prayer. The Bible says these all continued in prayer and supplication. Pentecost came in an atmosphere that was saturated by sincere prayer. They not only prayed, but they made supplication, which is to say that they implored, they begged God to send His Spirit to their waiting, hungry, empty hearts. Never have we been so aware that God's people are praying as we have been during this crusade. It seems that we've been giving superhuman strength for the occasion. Obstacles have been hurdled. Problems have been solved. Difficulties have been surmounted. Victories have been gained, which can only be attributed to the work of a gracious God in answer to the prayers of his people. Secondly, Pentecost was preceded by the unity of God's people. The Bible says these all continued with one accord. Never have we seen greater harmony among the workers and the committee members. As we watch the hundreds of ushers, counselors and choir members functioning as one body, we are reminded of Paul's words which he said, So we, being many, are one body in Christ. You cannot tell what denomination they are members of, but it is evident that they are Christians, and that is the important thing. God has blessed this spiritual unity and because of it a great volume of divine power has been released upon this city. When the people prayed, were in one accord and sought the will of God, Pentecost was the result. Then followed the sound from heaven, the mighty rushing wind and the fire of God. These are the elements that man cannot supply. These are the supernatural factors without which all else would be lifeless and worthless. A church on fire invariably attracts the multitudes. When the church loses its fire, its warmth and its passion, it cannot penetrate the barriers of paganism and materialism which surround it. The disciples of Christ made no impression upon a godless world until they became a church on fire. After they had prayed earnestly, waited patiently and believed sincerely, the fire from heaven fell upon them. The Bible says, Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were amazed. Church history reveals that many times more people are brought into the church during periods of revival than during eras of so-called normalcy. So many more, in fact, that I'm convinced that revival is the normal function of the Christian church. The church was born in a supernatural revival at Pentecost. It was nourished and invigorated by the revivals of the first century. It has been sustained by revivals down through the years. The church can no more dispense with these periods of spiritual resurgence than the Atlantic Ocean can exist without the flood tide which rushes in periodically to purge away all the filth and debris deposited by the stagnant ebbing waters. It has pleased God to send a flood tide to New York City. Spiritual indifference, hypocrisy, intolerance, ill will, and unbelief are being swept away in many lives. There is a concern for the lost never before noted among Christians here in New York City. Christianity is being discussed openly by people on the street, in the cabs, in the buses, everywhere. Everywhere there's an invigorating interest in spiritual matters. There are elements present here which defy explanation. An auditorium 
which only the most optimistic ventured to predict would be filled on weekends, has proven too small to accommodate the crowds every night. Last night, there were many that said that Yankee Stadium would be only half filled or a third filled on the hottest night of the year, and yet God did it. It was jammed with the greatest crowd in history. Every night this past week, it has been my privilege to speak to hundreds in the overflow crowd which milled around the 49th Street entrance at Madison Square Garden, but were unable to get in. Each evening, after a brief talk, scores of these standees indicated a willingness to accept Christ as their Savior and Lord. We've heard marvelous stories of people that have been converted right out on the street. Certainly the Lord is moving. But now in this time of great spiritual victory is the moment when the devil is going to strike. I am looking for Satan to strike during this coming week in an unprecedented way. That is the reason we need more prayer now than ever before. We need prayer that will build a wall around this city and around this crusade as we enter the 10th and the 11th weeks as we come to the most crucial period of this crusade. Many people have said, well, where does the strength of the team come from? You're having scores of meetings every day, week after week. How do you keep it up? As thy day, so shall thy strength be. We have sensed the prayers of the Lord's people. It is God that is supplying the strength. We need your prayer for physical strength. We need your prayer for spiritual strength, that God will give us more spiritual power than ever before. We need your prayer that God will also hold back the flood tide of the enemy. The Bible says when the enemy comes in like the flood, the Spirit of the Lord can lift a standard against him. Yes, we give glory to God this day, but we are staying on our knees beseeching God for even greater things, that the spirit of revival that is evident here will spread across the nation and throughout the world, and that we will see a revival in 1957. Yes, Many lives are being changed. Many homes rearranged. A few evenings ago, Captain Jennison of the New York City Police Force and one of our advisors told us that one of the officers under his supervision were sent out to an apartment house to quiet a family row. The couple were quarreling violently and the home was on the verge of total ruin. The policeman who was a Christian spoke to them about Christ and invited them to come to the crusade. The next night they came and both accepted Christ. They have both purchased Bibles and have discovered that the peace of Christ is the best answer to domestic confusion. We are seeing that on every hand. And so the mark of revival continues to leave its mark on the world's greatest city. Yesterday at Yankee Stadium, when we saw those people there, not to see a baseball game, but to hear the glorious good news, the greatest news ever to reach the ears of mankind, the tidings that Christ died for our sins and rose again for our justification, while our hearts were thrilled, we were all so humble to realize that it was the answer to the prayers of God's people. We are going to ask you to continue your prayers. And now you, who may be listening to my voice, but are not yet in Christ, I beg of you to heed Christ's appeal when he said, Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. That makes every man eligible. The condition for acceptance is not intelligence, riches, respectability, or achievements. The man who is a failure is just as welcome as the person who has succeeded. There is no difference, says the Bible. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But in Christ we find forgiveness for sin, cleansing from unrighteousness, rest from our labors, and a blessed hope for the future. Whoever you are that are listening to my voice can receive Christ into your heart. Many of you are riding along in your motor car. Many of you are on vacation, on the beach, in the mountains, at some club, listening to this broadcast. You can receive Christ just where you are, just as though you were in Madison Square Garden or Yankee Stadium, just as though you had walked down the aisle and openly confessed Christ as your Savior. So now in the quietness of your room, in the quietness of your car, you can say yes to Jesus Christ. Open your heart. And say, O oh God, I repent of my sins. I renounce my sins. By faith I receive Jesus Christ as Savior. As you are changing lives in New York City, so change my life. He'll do it. In a moment, in an instant, you can start a total new life in Christ. 
President Johnson gets overwhelming reception in Australia, screams the headlines of the Berlin newspapers this weekend. In spite of anti-war demonstrations, the Australians are giving the president one of the greatest receptions he has ever had. The eyes of Europe are on two conferences this weekend, the one in Manila and the other in Moscow. The Manila conference brings together the president of the United States and the American allies fighting in Vietnam. The Moscow conference brings together most of the communist world, with the exception of Red China and North Vietnam. Out of these two conferences may come momentous decisions that could affect every person in the world. Most of these decisions will not be announced publicly, and we may not know about them for months to come. Tonight here in Berlin, we hold the closing service of the Berlin Crusade. This past week, we have seen hundreds come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The crowds have averaged well over 10,000 people a night, which is large for Berlin, and there's been a sense of God's presence, especially when the appeal is made to receive Christ as Savior. Without any music, the people get up quietly from their seats all over the auditorium and come forward to give their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ. During the next two weeks, the eyes of the Christian world will be here on Berlin. This coming Tuesday night, the World Congress on Evangelism begins at the Congress Hall here in Berlin. More than 1,200 delegates from nearly 100 countries of the world are now gathering in Berlin for what could be one of the most historic conferences on evangelism ever held. The opening addresses will be given by Bishop Debelius of Berlin and Emperor Halis Selassie of Ethiopia, who is flying here especially to address the Congress. This Congress is being sponsored by the American religious periodical Christianity Today. Its purpose is to bring those who are engaged in the work of evangelism together from almost every country of the world for a time of prayer, discussion, and decision concerning the strategy of evangelizing the world in our generation. On the next three Sundays, the Hour of Decision will carry full reports of this momentous conference, and I hope that you will be listening. I found that one of the most effective means of communicating the gospel to the secular mind in Europe is to talk about the future as taught in the scriptures. This is the doctrine that they rarely have opportunity to hear about, but because of onrushing world events, they are vitally interested. Nearly everyone agrees that Germany, with its division, sits on a powder keg which could explode at any time. There are many indications that pressures are beginning to build up for the unification of Germany at almost any cost. Much of the philosophy of Germany today is pessimistic. For example, the suicide rate here in Berlin is very high. When the hope of the coming again of Christ is proclaimed, the message holds their interest even if they do not agree with it. Both the Old and the New Testaments declare unmistakably that Jesus Christ will someday, in God's time, come back to this earth. On that day, we shall see him in person, the Bible says. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. His second coming to earth will be different from his first coming. His return to the earth will be in the majesty of his person and in the glory of his power. The Bible says of that day, he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe in that day. Three Greek words are used to describe his coming. One describes this great event as a personal bodily appearance. No one doubts that his first coming was actual bodily and in person. The Bible says this same Jesus shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go. The same Bible that foretold his first coming tells us that the day of the Lord will come in the same way. That day is 2,000 years nearer than it was when Jesus said, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. The second Greek word used in describing his coming speaks of his appearance as coming out of the darkness like a star whose brilliance could not be detected until the shades of night are come. He is referred to as the day star which shall appear. As the gloom of a godless world deepens and the world topples on the brink of destruction, the day star Jesus Christ will appear in all of his glory. The Bible speaks of this moral gloom which will descend upon the world in the day of his coming. It says, For they that sleep, sleep in the night, 
and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober. Has the moral gloom ever been more dense than it is today? A glance at the daily newspapers here in Europe tells the sordid story of sin and evil which brood over the world. Murder, graft, bribery, assault, sex, offenses, and rape and war stare at us from the headlines, reminding us that we're living in moral darkness. The murder of a girl in the front of a church in Wisconsin. The murder of a clergyman in, in a Christian center in Columbus, Ohio. The stabbing of a young bride by a boy in Fort Worth, Texas. The murder of a surgeon's wife in Cincinnati have all been front page news here in Germany. The American crime wave is appalling to Europeans. They have nothing comparable to it. A German leader said to me the other day, America must be on the verge of anarchy. An American government official visiting here in Germany said this past week that America is bleeding internally. Certainly the moral darkness is getting blacker, not only in America, but in other parts of the world. However, the Bible says that when the night is the blackest, the day star, Jesus Christ, shall appear. The third Greek word describes his return as an unveiling, the sudden appearance of one who has been hidden from view. The Bible says the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven. When he returns, the veil of separation will be lifted and the spectacular beauty of his glory will meet our gaze. To them who love Christ, that day will be a glorious revelation. To them who know him not, it will be a day of condemnation. To Christians, Christ's return will be a time of ecstasy, joy, and glory. But to those who know not God and have refused to obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, it will be a day of judgment. The Bible describes the Lord Jesus in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel. Words cannot get any plainer than that. Here is the wrath of God that is going to be poured out upon a world in rebellion against God, a planet that has refused his son Jesus Christ and that has rejected the love of God. God's wrath and vengeance are going to be poured out. The Bible says that God is angry with the wicked every day. We've heard so much of the love and the mercy and the grace of God that we've forgotten the dark line in God's face, that God is also a God of judgment. Be sure your sins will find you out, says the Bible. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Judgment is coming. The truth of divine judgment is extremely unpopular today. Some ministers have stressed the love aspects of God, but have neglected to warn men of his judgment. We should be reminded that though there are many scriptures which reveal the love of God, there are many more which tell of the sureness of his judgment. God is not only love, God is also justice and holy and is going to bring judgment upon those that reject his law and his son. One of the principal reasons why this generation has forgotten God is that it has been made to feel that God doesn't matter, that he really isn't concerned with our behavior, our sin, or the judgment for the sinner. The entire Christian world was shocked this past week by the sex report of the British Council of Churches that disregards all biblical moral law and encourages promiscuous sexual activity and all in the name of the church. The Bible solemnly warns, Behold, the Lord cometh to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Even our talking, the words of our mouth, are going to be used against us in that day of judgment. He will judge those who insist on living lives of greed and selfishness. He will judge those who feed their animal passions to the neglect of their starving souls. He will judge those who seek to merit their salvation by their own goodness and righteousness rather than by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He will judge those who have heard and understood the gospel but have refused to obey it. He will judge those even in the church that have given permission for others to sin in the name of the church. The words, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, will attend his sure judgment of those who have willfully trifled with his mercy. He will judge those who have been given every opportunity to know him but have willfully rejected or neglected him. On that day, 
The wheat will be separated from the chaff, the sheep from the goats, and the saved from the lost. The Bible says that every eye shall see. What an anguish of seeing him in all of his beauty and glory for one fleeting moment, only to be excluded from his presence forever. And that's what this passage teaches. Better that you had never beheld him than to hold his shining beauty in your memory throughout eternity and know that you will never see him again. That in itself would be the worst kind of mental and spiritual hell. But lastly, that day of his coming will be a day of glorious salvation. At Calvary, we were saved from the penalty of sin. Daily, we can be saved from the power of sin through the operation of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. But at his appearing, we shall be saved from the very presence of sin. It will bring an end to evil, intrigue, dishonesty, conniving, plotting, deceit, injustice, intolerance, crime, and all the hideousness of sin and its consequences. Not only so, but this world of unrest will be changed into a haven of rest. The Bible says, and you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. When Christ is king, harmony and accord will be restored to a world which for centuries has known only discord, war, and confusion. Then inequalities and injustices of life will be removed, and the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Here in Berlin, we can see the failure of communism. Its failure is symbolized by the wall that runs through this city, locking the people of East Berlin in a virtual prison. Thus the promises of the communists about the glorious future under their leadership no longer have the appeal they once had. Ladies and gentlemen, the future belongs to God and his Christ. The day of his reign approaches, and that day is clearly marked on God's calendar. Only God knows when it will be, but it could be much nearer than we think. Millions of men and women who have been heedless of the gospel are seriously thinking about God these days, even here in Europe. There is a feeling here in Germany that something is about to happen, that things cannot continue as they are now. God's warnings are plainly before us. Destruction never comes from God without ample warning. God warned the world of the flood. He warned Sodom and Gomorrah of the fire. He warned Jerusalem of its destruction. A clear warning has been given in Scripture. We see warnings all about us today. And the Bible says we are to repent while there's still time, while the day of opportunity is here, because there's a day coming when you will call upon God, but he will not hear. You will seek God, but you will not find him, because the day of judgment is coming. The time is short. If you're ever to repent of your sins and receive Christ, it is now. The Bible says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Are you ready? Do you know Christ? Have you obeyed the gospel? Have you trusted him for salvation? God has done everything possible to prepare you for this event. Have you made any preparation? Be ye also ready, said Jesus, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, as we look upon our world and see the sin, the misery, and the brutality of mankind, we know that the only hope is the divine intervention. And we thank Thee for the many passages in the Old and the New Testament that promise that someday God will intervene. We pray that we will receive His Son, Jesus Christ, while the door of grace is still open. And we pray for this World Congress on Evangelism that begins next Tuesday here in Berlin, that the Spirit of God will descend upon that conference, that it will become another Pentecost, and give to us the opportunity of reaching the world in our generation for Jesus Christ. For we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.
Thank you.